Oh, and he's back. The man behind the mask. And he's out of control. How's that for a mixed metaphor? Okay. A little showboat, you know, a little entertainment value for you. Did you miss me? Did you miss me? I missed you. I did. We're going to have some fun today. We're going to do a short little video. I, well, you know me. <laughs> promises, promises, right? Uh, what I want to do is a short little thing. Uh, it's actually going to be kind of a recapitulation of material that I previously had discussed in a prior video that I did on artificial intelligence black goo. But I have learned the hard way that the folks that want to learn about AI black goo don't really want to learn about AI black goo, do they? No, they just want to know that they know everything there is to know about artificial intelligence black goo. If you're one of those people, I dare you to check out my videos. You might have a little paradigm shift, and there's nothing wrong with that. Speaking of paradigm shifts, let me start with my intentions. Let me tell you what we're going to do today, what I'm going to try to do, my little thesis, and we'll see if we can have some fun with it. And we'll see the point at the end is this, is that can you remain green? Can you remain teachable? Can we talk about things that you may disagree with me about? Okay. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about three concepts. Uh, we're going to talk about monatomic gold. Monatomic gold. We're going to talk about a medicinal um, item tincture emulsion product called Ormus, okay? And we're going to talk about the Anunnaki, and we're going to explore Zachariah Sitchin's concept of the Anunnaki, uh, his theories as to why they were here, uh, his theories as to what they did to humanity. And we're going to take a look at these three concepts that I've seen multiple times, you know, um, discussed together. And I think that there's a real reason why when we explore these concepts and ideas and unpack them a bit, they're contradictory and they can't really, there's reasons, there's logical reasons to think that this couldn't possibly be a real depiction of the world as it is. That one or more of these concepts may be able to exist in the same universe together, but all three of them, you're going to have some real logical problems and we're going to explore them, okay? The purpose of this video may be to give you information that you haven't heard before, information that might shift your paradigm, knock your paradigm, threaten your paradigm, if you're a true believer in any of these things, okay? Now, I'm not here to hurt you, and I'm not here to break your heart. I'm here to share with you ideas that I have about a subject matter that apparently you're interested in as well. And I'm going to end the video by suggesting this, is that, you know, you might, if, if First of all, you might just dis disagree with me. The information that I have to share with you today, the thoughts and concepts and ideas I share with you today, just might not move your brain and heart. Oh, no, he's wrong for this reason. And you might have reasons to believe or to know that you understand deficiencies in my logic, uh, deficiencies in my definitional standards, uh, deficiencies in my knowledge, whatever the case may be. Or you may find that the, the concepts and ideas that I'm raising do rock your mental picture and frame a little bit. And to those people, I want to say, you know, you can have two reactions to that. Number one, you can accept the upgrade. You can take the additional information and data on. You can accept the fact that, hey, this is a good thing. Life moves forward. I remain teachable and green. I want to learn new things. Oh, I thought this about that. Then I heard this new information. I was able to take it on board. Now, I would suggest that that's a successful way to process information that sh shakes our paradigm and our worldview. I dare say that I've experienced people have an alternative reaction to things that I may have said in the past that have, that have been equally as threatening to their worldview or concepts of reality. And that reaction is to just attack, just to say, F you, you don't know what you're talking about, you're a jerk, moron. What, do you hate everybody? You hate everything. This guy's scared to love. Co Intel Pro Agents spreading this information far and wide. Well, in order to keep this quick, like I said, three concepts, three concepts, three concepts, monatomic gold, Ormus, Zacharias uh, Sitchin's uh, statements about the Anunnaki. Now, any one of these subjects, if you look online, whether you Google it or whether you go search for YouTube videos, 
you're going to find that there's a lot of information out there, a lot of information with you know divergent sets and standards and divergent definitions. So I'm going to start off by giving very, very simple thumbnail explanations of what I'm talking about or the, the simplest conception of these, these things are. And the reason that I'm doing that is because, look, if we don't narrow it down somewhat, we're not going to be able to have a brief video. We're not going to be able to have fruitful discussion. So let's break it down. And I'm, I'm very aware of the fact, okay, that, that in doing this, in simplifying, in by putting everything, quote, unquote, in a nutshell, you lose a lot of subtleties. So when I come to my definitions of monatomic gold, when I come to my definitions of Ormus, you might say to yourself, hey, I don't agree with that definition, or he's, no, he's wrong. That, that's fair enough. But I hope you know that I'm not willfully trying to, you know, um, frame things artificially or to skew them, you know, intentionally, that I am just trying to simplify matters so we can have more effective and direct communication, okay? And, yeah, we'll get through it. We'll get through it. Let's start at the top. Monatomic gold. What is it? You know, I first became aware of the... the um, concept of monatomic gold, I, I guess in this book by Joseph P. Farrell, The Philosopher's Stone, basically an exploration of alchemy and um, speculation regarding uh, what the alchemical process was in the past. You know, a lot of people in today's modern milieu understand it as maybe as a metaphor or an early attempt at being able to discuss human psychology in a world where you weren't really allowed to talk about all alternative concepts of human psychology outside the church, lest you run the risk of not suspecting the Spanish Inquisition, right? Okay, but Joseph P. Farrell in this book, I believe published in 2009 by the amazing publishing house, Farrell House. If you haven't checked out Farrell House materials, do so. Go to their website immediately. Some of the best material out there, some of the best conspiracy alternative media uh, research out there is done by Mr. Joseph P. Farrell, a, a true Oxford uh, educated scholar. Um, I believe in, you know, I believe his degrees were in comparative, his doctor degrees were in comparative theology, uh, but he's a, a real materialist, I think you could say, and so if, when you get to his conception of the Philosopher's Stone and alchemy, um, it's, a, it's a real physical process. He thinks you, it's chemicals and it's, and it's, and it's science, and it, anyone who's familiar with the work of Mr. Farrell, he's got a lot of theories about alternative breakaway civilizations, um, alternative scientific explorations done by the, the Third Reich, done by, you know, covert, you know, underground elements in, in the U.S. military, right, that he that he searches for and he thinks that you can physically find things like UFO phenomena defined in, in, in scientific terms. I did a lot of research about ancient Egypt, which, you know, you could take on board. Do I believe everything that he writes? No, but do I recommend him as a researcher? Yeah, I do. So anyway, back to back to the point, trying to keep it brief. Uh, the Philosopher's Stone brings up the concept of monatomic gold. Obviously, uh, Joseph P. Farrell is tying it into his to an overarching thesis uh, that monatomic gold or the research that was done with monatomic gold informs or can be... Uh, complementary or verifying information to uh, other, you know, Russian research uh, into alchemy and the, and the processes thereby. Also, you know, Joseph B. Farrell's favorite subject, the Germans. What were the, the, what were the Third Reich, uh, what were they able to do with alchemy and monatomic gold? So that's where I first heard about monatomic gold. And I'll tell you, if you're going to read Joseph P. Farrell, this is not the book to start with. Oh, I don't know if it's just the subject matter. It goes into a lot of chemistry and a lot of hard science, which I don't like, and I really don't feel confident in my ability to ascertain bullshit from from reality because it all kind of sounds like crazy bullshit, right? Um, but an interesting read, but but not not one that I would start with. I don't, I, I dare say, not one of his best, even from a research perspective. I'm sure he was truly motivated by an interest in the subject, though I don't know if he hit the mark. Hey, it is what it is, but. In his book, he, I first learned about the notion of monatomic gold, and it's uh, apparently it was discovered sometime in the 1970s by a farmer out in Arizona by the name of David Hudson. Okay, and the work of David Hudson is explored and, and annotated and footnoted in this book, so I feel that fairly comfortable in understand telling you what I think monatomic gold is, as it's defined, and why I, I don't agree with it. Now, look, guys, I don't believe in monatomic gold. 
I don't believe in Ormus. In the sense, I believe that there's a chemical formulation called Ormus, and you can produce it, and you can drink it if you if you really want to. But I, as far as what it purports to be, I mean, I just think that any magical properties it has are the same magical properties contained within the wafer and the wine after the transfiguration. It's it's mental magic, and that's not. I don't say that to be dismissive. I just say that to say we'll get there anyway. And I don't believe in Zacharias uh, Sitchin's conception of the Anunnaki. I don't think he read Sumerian. I don't think he had the ability to translate cuneiform. I think the works of all 12 of his books, whatever, his, his great magnum opus, his great over, was just fiction. Creative fiction and speculation, trans-channeling, whatever the heck you want to call it, I don't think that he was qualified to talk about the science of the Sumerian language or to provide real insight or information about it. That's just me you may have completely different concepts or thoughts about it. Please don't be so ignorant as to say that if I disagree with you about Zikaria Sitchin, it must mean that I'm a fucking idiot. Right? Grow up. You know, if I dis you cannot say that the work of Zechariah Sitchin is so self-evidently self-verifying that only a fool would contradict it or say it doesn't exist. One might merely say that gravity doesn't exist or that the earth is round. You know? All aboard the bullshit train. Anyway, so I don't think about believing any of these concepts, but I do believe that if these concepts were true, they couldn't coexist together. And let's get right into the meat and potatoes, because we, like I said, I keep on promising a short video, and I think if I stick to my little notes here, we're going to be able to do what we want to do, hopefully successfully. So David Hudson discovers a, a white powder on his farm, a mysterious white powder that has got inexplicable properties sent to various uh, agencies to test it. No one can figure out what the stuff does, is or does. But eventually, Mr. Hudson comes to the conclusion that he's discovered what he calls monatomic gold. And basically what monatomic gold is, in theory, is it's a form of gold, right, but that exists in a, a single atom state. So if, 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 we, if we were to think of gold as being this collective... You know, uh, when if you have a bar of gold, right, it's AU, whatever it is on the chemical table, it's that, it's that much of that, right? But he says that there's a monatomic gold where in the simple atomic forms, just one element, uh, one atom at a time, that it's got these special properties involving it being an orbiting, random, monatomic element. Basically, the theory of David Hudson is that there's certain elements that have this special property when presented in this quote-unquote monatomic state. As I previously stated in a previous video, this doesn't, just doesn't make any sense scientifically. You know, an atom of gold is an atom of gold is an atom of gold. Whether it's in a powdered form, a solid form, I guess you could render gold into a gas under certain chemical conditions. It's still... You know, it's definable as what makes gold gold. It's a, it's a combination of specific atoms and molecules tied together that creates an element that's been defined and placed on the, on the periodic table of the elements. The notion that it could, number one, that you could handle it or experience it on a day-to-day -day fashion in some sort of monatomic or single atom state is just its ridiculous. It would just be, by definition, a gas and would float away. But more importantly than all that stuff, I just wanted to share with people who do believe in monatomic gold to understand that the chemists, mainstream chemistry, does not agree with the concept of monatomic gold. That you can go to a thousand and three different uh, New Age fairs, spiritualist conventions, and you'll hear people uh, selling materials, how to make uh, monatomic gold at home, grow all the gold you want at home. Okay? And no. I, I just, you know, I, it just, the scientists, science, mainstream chemistry says there are things that exist as monatomic uh, elements, and they're defined as monatomic elements. Gold, platinum, silver, they're not on them. What they are, what is on the, the table of elements, what are considered uh, monatomic elements or things that can be presented in a monatomic form, are what's known as noble gases. Helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, okay? Not gold, not silver, not platinum. So if you want to believe in monatomic gold, just know and understand that it's the same push. It's the same effect as saying... I'm a born-again Christian, therefore I don't believe in evolution. It's just saying to another scientific worldview, discounted, contradicted, 
I don't agree. I agree 100% in this alternative worldview. And it is an alternative worldview. So if you believe that you can get better chemistry out of a farmer out in Arizona than you can from, say, chemists, well, what can I tell you? I mean, I think that you're probably having to be believing a lot of different you know, theories and conspiracies about them trying to hide the truth about science and how science works. So that's monatomic gold. Now, monatomic gold has gotten some popularity mostly because of its, of its uh, purported health effects and its integration into a product originally manufactured and, and, and sold by Mr. David Hudson. But now that is kind of, kind of, a, it's kind of a folk remedy that's floating around on the internet, like a homeopathic remedy. It can be prepared at home. You can purchase it through a third party, and you can take it. It purportedly has amazing health effects, including psychic health effects. It's going to make you a better telepath. It's going to improve your telekinesis, your connection to the fundamental laws and energies of the universe. Hey, all beautiful things, right? All, I, you, who would have a problem with that? It's also become very popular because the monatomic gold has been fully now integrated into, into the work of Zachariah Sitchin or those people that are following in the research trail of Zachariah Sitchin. Um, that, that the monatomic gold is now the gold that the Anunnaki were coming here not to jump too far ahead in order to harvest from planet Earth. They needed the monatomic gold. It's also been suggested in the popularity of this new theme of the artificial intelligence black goo that the artificial intelligence black goo is monatomic in itself. Either it's a corollary or an antithesis of monatomic gold, right? It's like the, the bad version of it. Or it's simply, like monatomic gold, the form product of, you know, alien intelligences on planet Earth. So Ormus. Ormus is a, we're going to move on to. So that, this monatomic gold in a nutshell. And like I said, I don't agree with it. I don't think that the, chem, the, the chemistry science ratifies it. I think it contradicts it. And it makes it look like pseudoscience. Okay? Now, that's just, you could say that that's my opinion. I would say to you, you're going to have to find me monatomic gold. And you're going to have to find me monatomic gold in, in a state, okay, where an accredited chemical chemistry lab runs your element, your ormus, whatever, through the wicky wacky machine, whatever they do, and they come out the other end and guess, hey, guess what? It is. It's single elements of, of, of gold presenting in this powdered state. Good luck with that. I don't think it's going to happen. I think it's a safe and easy bet to say that the chemistry is just made up. This was, and like I said, I, I read the goddamn book, you know, that includes the research of the correlations to the research of, of Richard C. Hoagland and David Wilcock and all the other favorites. And I got to tell you, I think it's just, I think it's great for selling books and it might be great for high, for fueling your high end octane speculation, Mr. Farrell. But I just don't think that it makes sense from a chemistry point of view. And I don't think it, I don't think it warranted your research and attention. I think your research and attention could have been spent elsewhere, but hey, that's just me. So Ormus. Now, like I said, we're going to have to thumbnail these things. And if you see the way that I treated monatomic gold, I think you're aware of the fact of how brief we're going to keep this. We're going to be defining these concepts in terms in seven or eight simple senses that I, that I think would be inoffensive to all people generally who believe in these concepts. So if you believe in monatomic gold, that's what you believe. It's, it's this single element of yada yada, single atom of blah, whatever. Ormus. Now, in order to talk about Ormus, there's multiple different recipes out there. Uh, it is considered to be monatomic gold. It is always sold and associated, marketed and researched and discussed in the concept of it being this uh, uh, an aspect of or consisting of monatomic gold. And again, like I said, the chemistry just doesn't make sense to me, though you might have alternative research and, and uh, chemistry to cite and to explain to me too. More than willing to hear about it. How made. So what I wanted to do is I found what I thought was a good YouTube video about Ormus. There's a lot of them demonstrating how to make it at home or demonstrating how people manufacture it uh, for sale and distribution. I found a great video that I thought was highly entertaining I'm going to recommend for you. It, it's by a YouTube, it's on a YouTube channel called Trebor7, T-R-E-B-O-R-7, S-E-V-E-N. It's an interesting name. But apparently it's, it's, it's uh, by a... Individual run by an individual and entrepreneur named Robert Allen. The reason I picked this video is that he does a great demonstration of how he makes his Ormus for his company. I believe it's called Sacred Elements or whatever. The ingredients. Oh, and he's 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 describing in this video what's known as the wet method for the production of a, of of 
Ormus. I've also heard it referred to as the Egyptian method. Like I said, folks, I looked into this. I really did. Okay? I looked on the, the chemistry forums. I looked on the alternative forums, the alternative health forums. I looked at the YouTube videos of Mr. David Hudson. I looked at the YouTube videos, I believe his name is Lauren Gardner. He's a very, very respected researcher on the concept of, you know, the Illuminati and Freemasons and the connections thereof. He does an hour and a half presentation, earlier hour and a half presentation on, on, on Ormus and Monatomic Gold. Also, Tex Mars. Uh, is a real aficionado of monatomic gold. But this monatomic gold is like free energy or the cashing machines. Everyone talks about it. They, they put on these elaborate demonstrations, but no one actually produces the fucking science. It says, oh, the University of Harvard just came out with a great new study. So guess what? The shit that Tex Mars brought in was gold. Holy crap, you can make it at home. Now think of this, folks. If you're going to take this as this, what these people are saying as literal fact, then you're taking on the concept that you can make gold at home using the following ingredients dead sea salt sodium hydroxide also known as lye be careful distilled water and spring water once more from the top dead sea salt also everyone said basically you're not allowed, allowed to use iodized salt right you can't use the man salt you can't use processed salt right um, you gotta use you know real dead sea salt or you know what they call it, the celtic sea salt you know or the hawaiian sea salt everyone's going nuts about the pink hawaiian salt right i've tried it it's good it's good and it's also a new kind of salt right it's exciting dead sea salt sodium hydroxide distilled water and spring water and everyone knows what if you know about ormus what it turns out to be you first you mix the salt in the water then you add your your live solution that's been that's been you know kind of stepped down the sophisticated people who make Ormus will actually get out a, a pH, you know, measuring uh, instrument to measure the, the alkaline or acidic nature of, of the of the Ormus. It's supposed to be alkaline. That's another alternative health healthcare thing that we're not going to go into today, but you could, this notion of acids and alkaline foods and waters and substances and how they affect the human health. Dead sea salt, sodium hydroxide, distilled water, spring water. At the end of the day, what you end up with is jism in a cup, right? Ormus looks like it's basically water that looks like it's got heavy white particulate matter floating in it. You know, and, you know, the, this this video that I picked up is very interesting because because uh, Mr. Allen is very, very candid at the end about what he sees in Ormus and what he thinks Ormus is. And it's a beautiful, sacred metaphor for a magical solution. Now, I'm not trying to be dismissive or to say that that's, that, 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 that makes the whole endeavor bunko. I think the whole endeavor will be judged on whether or not it's wise to drink or not drink Ormus. will be based on the, the scientific health benefits thereof. What's the sodium content? What's the mercury content? What's the lye content? And should you be drinking that on a regular basis? I don't know. I'm not a nutritionist. It is what it is. But let me just suggest this, folks. Dead sea salt, sodium hydroxide, they're not the chemical components that lead to gold. I'm sorry. I mean, this is just, I mean, folks. Do you, I mean, if you believe in, look, this plastic cup, the ink in this marker, the, 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 the fiber optic technology that gets data from point A to B, this is all based on chemistry. Do you really think it's all been a lie? And there's some mysterious Smurf chemistry, some ultra-simplified, you know, n Star Wars metaphor technology that is the real way chemistry works. It might be that you want to believe that, because if you believe that, then things might be more exciting, more sexy, uh, more solvable, right? If you've got cancer and you believe in Ormus, then you believe that you've identified something that can cure you of cancer, right? And that's got to feel good looks like a suspension or emulsion i guarantee you any food chemist any 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 true chemist could tell you exactly what's happening with the sodium hydroxide hits the sea salt i guarantee it's some it's some bonding it's, it creates an emulsion it's doing something but i don't think it's creating it's certainly not creating gold and i certainly have heard no reports of anyone sending this one to a chemist and the chemist coming back saying holy shit i couldn't believe you could make gold at home and guys if you make gold at home and it was this fucking easy don't you think the chemist would find out about it and don't you think that they would be making all sorts of fucking gold I mean, the reason that why, why gold is considered a valuable metal and the reason that Zachariah Sitchin projected just like his buddy L. Ron Hubbard 
Oh, the, the, it's such a common theme of, of 1950s science fiction, the work of L. Ron Hubbard, the work of Zachariah Sitchin. This is another guy I'm forgetting about. The notion that even H.G. Wells, the notion that they had to come here for the gold. Well, why is it? It's because these people, before they started writing science fiction, were writing Pirates of Penzance. They were writing, like, you know, spy novels. It's an update, and so what's valuable? What do people get? What are they here for? What's valuable? What would they need? Well, Mars needs women. Right? That makes sense. And these are the Anunnaki, they must need fucking gold, right? To repair their atmosphere and whatever. We're going to get into the meat and potatoes soon of my whole thesis and why I don't think these things work together. So look, guys, what can I tell you? I don't think that Ormus is gold. I don't think it's gold. It may be whatever it is, and it might very well be fact that there's a medicinal health effect associated with taking an unidized sea salt in combination with distilled... Um, Sodium hydroxide, though, I can't imagine what that would be. Um, but like I said, I don't believe in it, but I believe they've done a fair assessment of what it is, how it's made, and what it's purported to be. Let's move on to the third piece of our puzzle, Zachariah Sitchin and the Anunnaki. Now, we're really going to thumbnail this down. I'm going to make it as simple as possible so we can handle the concept easy and work with it in our kind of our logical proofs that we're setting up to happen down the line. In the simplest way, in the simplest articulation, let's just say this. Zachariah Sitchin proposed a theory that the millions of years ago, I think, Anunnaki came from Planet X, Planet Nibiru, this uh, mysterious um, Planet X that is in our solar system, but it's so odd from the orbits of our normal uh, bodies in the solar system that we don't notice it and it only shows up every 33,000 years, whatever the case may be. And that from this amazing planet, the Anunnaki came to Earth. And when they came to Earth, they came to Earth for gold. They needed the gold. Usually it's presented both in the works of L. Ron Hubbard. Read Battlefield Earth. I mean, this shit is just the fucking same shit. Uh, that they needed it to repair their environment. That there's something like an ozone layer type problem happening on Nibiru or Planet X, and so they've got to heal. It. They got to do it themselves. Also, because Ormus and Monatomic Gold has now been integrated fully into this Zachary Sitchin mythology. Now we're supposed to, we're taught that the also the reason that they need to the Monatomic Gold the Anunnaki did was to heal themselves. That if they were if the Monatomic Gold technology the Ormus technology can keep you living like Methuselah for a thousand years, and if you don't, you're a dead Draco, right? You don't want to be a dead reptilian. You know, hanging out in the desert, dying. No, you want to thrive and survive and learn how to transportate yourself or whatever the case may be. Hold on one second. All right, back in the saddle again. Where was I? Okay, so we're going to thumbnail this. So the Anunnaki came to Earth for gold. They needed a gold. They needed a way to get it. There wasn't enough of them. And they certainly weren't interested in breaking a reptilian sweat, right? So what they did is they took Homo sapien and they genetically modified them to create a slave race to help them get this gold okay um i think that's a fairly easy description obviously we, he wrote 12 books on the subject okay so i'm giving the guy short shrift we are nutshelling it but i think that that's a fairly inoffensive way to articulate the zacharias such an ancient alien theory they came here, they came here for gold, for health reasons and for scientific reasons to repair their planet. They genetically modified man accordingly, under some accounts adding their own DNA, under some accounts removing DNA. We had a million strands of DNA and now we're down to two. Okay, I don't know what a million strands of DNA, I mean, whatever. Um, so that's so I feel like that that is a fair, fairly good assessment in a nutshell of Zachariah Sitchin's what that thesis or that aspect of his material or his worldview. Okay? Now, I don't believe it. Okay? And I've, I've been through this a thousand times on, on different videos. That I think the work of Zachariah Sitchin is a particularly shameful chapter in alternative media research. And it goes to show you that people are much more interested in reading flight and fight and fantasy, right? Reading science fiction than they are reading hard science like the works of Stanton Friedman or to a lesser extent Richard Dolan or the other, on the, on the, on the, any of the other qualified alternative media researchers, Nick Pope, all the guys that people don't like, right? All the, all the party poopers, all the balloon poppers, all the people that say, um, let's, let's analyze this in a scientific way and let's not look at the work of Billy Meyer talking to ABBA 
<laughs> you know what I mean? On, on a spaceship, right? Let, let's let's concentrate on some real real stuff. So I don't believe it. And if you want if you want a, a really a good debunking, an easy to take debunking of Zachariah Sitchin's material, there's a YouTube channel operated by Chris White, C H R I S W H I T E, and he has a video series called Ancient Aliens Debunked. Basically, he goes through the ancient aliens material. And it correctly identifies that it's all the work of Zachariah Sitchin and Eric Von Daniken. Zachariah Sitchin and Eric Von Daniken, along with Paul Vallee, uh, wrote books in the 1960s and 70s that were very popular with people. And then the latest generation of researchers that we see populating shows like Ancient Aliens and populating the YouTube channels and the internet radio shows just basically come from that. They're just, they've taken on that material as wholesale. They've built their life and research on it. And you guys have wasted your fucking lives because this guy had no concept and idea of what he was talking about. The fact of the matter that even though Sumerian is a dead language, just like Pali, a dead language, and just like Sanskrit, a dead language, there are people qualified, academics qualified to read and understand and, and translate this material. And you might have a third party or an alternative person that comes along and they say, I've got this alternative explanation. They're analyzing it incorrectly. They want to keep me out of the academy. But the fact of the matter is, here's the real reason. Well, that person needs to lay out their evidence and scientific facts. Where did they learn Sumerian? How did they learn to translate cuneiform? What third party research did they engage in? What third party materials were they looking at? What was the product of speculation? Are you clearly articulating what speculation? Do you know what I mean? Should, would, should the book be properly labeled fiction or speculation or myth or metaphor, whatever the case may be? Um, but Chris White has a, has a show called a, the little, little YouTube video. You can see it in its little forms. Where you can see the full full movie version where he basically goes through and debunks Zachariah Sitchin. And it's debunking that's happened since the 1970s. He wrote his book in the 1970s, and believe you me, day one, the people were coming out writing reviews and things like the New York Times Magazine, New York Times Review of Books, and saying, uh, guys, folks, fellas, this could be a problem. Um, somebody tell Avon to stop lying to people. But, of course, that didn't happen, and the sexy books sell, and the, the dry scientific research stays on the shelf, never to be heard from again. Okay, so I don't believe any of that stuff. Talking about Chris White's video, I do want to say this. Uh, there's a problem. He does a very good job of debunking Zachariah Sitchin, but then at the end, at the very end of his videos, makes... Hold on. <coughs> Sorry about that. Because what I believe is a critical error that happens is that basically he then says that his ultimate proof for why the Ancient Aliens show is debunked or debunkable is because he now knows the truth as a born-again Christian that this is not how it happened. It happened the way it says in the Bible. It's exactly the same problem that that movie on chemtrails, uh, What the Hell Are They Spraying, has. has. For two-thirds of What the Hell Are They Spraying, anybody from any political point of view or valence or perspective or religion or faith or background could see oh yeah that is strange oh yeah that is interesting science oh yeah that is an interesting document to produce but about two-thirds of the way through it you make a right turn into the illuminati right and you lose i think you, you lose a whole bunch of people who would say well i'm interested in science and i'm interested in the science you just laid out but whoa when, when did we just go into conspiracy theory land a contrary argument might be that you had to go that way. I don't know. Chris White, Ancient Aliens Debunked, check it out. But bear in mind that I warned you at the end, he does the born-again Christian thing. Even though I don't think that that does anything to eliminate the scholarly research that he does leading up to it. If you like a fan of uh, you know debunking stuff and stuff, Chris White's channel is one to subscribe to because he covers a lot of this stuff. Okay. So again, like in summation, we've got three concepts. Monotonic gold, Ormus. And Zachariah Sitchin's Anunnaki. And like I said, here, here's the food for thought. Okay, Can these concepts work together? Or are there obvious reasons why they should be considered uh, mutually exclusive? Meaning that one or two of these three things could be maybe correct, but to have all three or present all three as being correct leads to some logical, real logical problems. And I think this is, this is really where we need to be and this is where I'm going with this thing. Okay, hopefully you're still with me. Okay, here's the problem. Let's look at the ease of manufacture of Ormus. If Ormus is true, and Ormus is monatomic gold, and monatomic gold is true, and monatomic gold is the reason why the Anunnaki got here, then the Anunnaki came here, right? Why? Because they needed, they needed something that they could have made with the following ingredients. 
Dead Sea Salt. Now, I'm assuming that any sort of, you know, what is it, uh, sodium chloride? What is that? What's salt? Sodium chloride, right? Sea salt, dead sea salt, whatever. Something special about Gaia, maybe. But otherwise, you know, you're using salt, sodium hydroxide, and fucking water. Let me dare say this. This is this is my concepts and my, my theory. If monatomic gold is why they came here and, and monatomic gold is Ormus, and you can make monatomic gold the same way you make Ormus, and you can make Ormus in your fucking kitchen after watching a 12-minute video, then it's fucking axiomatic that the Anunnaki would not have to fly fucking mile one, let alone hundreds of miles, right, interstellar travel in order to get here cause for fucking gold, right? Okay, Ben, you say, okay, so maybe what if we take Ormus out of the picture, okay? There's problems even if we take Ormus out of the picture. Why? Monotom the gold, it's gold. They needed to come, travel, inter interstellar travel, interdimensional travel under some circumstances because they needed gold. They did it in element, and when they got here, they were able to use to demonstrate a sophisticated knowledge of not only space travel, but sophisticated knowledge of genetics, alien genetics, and your exogenetics. That they were able to come here and work with humans. Some people say the Anunnaki came themselves. Some say the Anunnaki were just draconian. Some say they were just reptilian. Some some say they were uh, a coalition of Zeta Reticuli, Dracos, and fucking the Nordics, whatever tall whites or whatever. And they were all in cahoots. So all those guys, with all their fucking technology, couldn't figure out nanotechnology, right? The production of simple elements from base uh, chemi uh, chemical, uh, you know, other elements. In other words, what I'm suggesting is that if they could come here from millions of miles away, and if they could experiment with their genetics, they're already demonstrating a level of technology levels above the t level of technology that they would need to manipulate nanotechnology in order to produce gold out of, I don't know, plastic or wood or any other element. Here's the notion of nanotechnology and nano, nano manufacture at this level. And by the way, this is current science that's doable and is done. Basically, let's break down uh, elements, let's break down atoms, and let's rearrange them at the sub-molecular and molecular level to rebuild new constructs. You could build simple nano machines like computers that are like millions of a hair, you know, human hair width length. Or you could do things like experiments with taking plastics, breaking those elements down to create new material. Now, I might be over speculating on where the science actually is as far as provable and demonstrable results, but we definitely know where the fact that we're working with things on a nano level. Way, way earlier than we're doing anything even remotely like uh, manned interstellar travel, okay? So if interstellar travel is by magnitudes more complicated than nanotechnology, hence the real strides in nanotechnology will no real hope uh, for manned missions to distant planets. Therefore, if they, if they had the ability to come here and make us farm for gold by messing with our genetics, then clearly they would have had the technology available to just stay the fuck at home. Right? Just make the fucking Ormus there. Right? Even if you take the Ormus out, you're just left with monatomic gold. Still, there's no way in hell it would make more sense for them to travel to a third a third location in the known universe in order, for, in order to produce or pr procure an element. Number one, they would have run by, you know, just a million and three other bodies with way more ability or to produce, you know, the, the gold or the elements that they needed. The genetic engineering on a massive scale, if we believe Zachariah Sitchin, David Icke, and Simon Parks and, and their milieu, that these guys have the ability to take a million strands of DNA and intelligently bring them down and pull them down to two strands of DNA to fuck us, right? To take away our ability to, like, speak with each other psychically or whatever. I dare say if they're able to do that, if they have that technology that's sophisticated, I'm repeating myself at this point, that they would have the technology to not have to fucking come here in the first place, right? Ay, ay, ay. And the artificial intelligence black goose and nanotechnology as well. Fuck you, right? That's all I have to say on that. Oh, God. So, look. There's it. That's the video. And here we are at the conclusion. Okay? Now, I know I get strong. I know I get saucy. I know I get a little bit aggressive. And that may be an ineffective way, right, to create a clear, crystal clear, easy communication. But I am who I am. And you are who you are. 
So where do we find ourselves now? Having gone through this material, having discussed and broached these subjects with you, where are you? Where am I? Where am I in your opinion? Okay. Did you believe in monatomic gold? Did you believe in Ormus? Do you, do you believe in the work of Zachariah Sitchin? If so, have I suggested to you information or ideas that might make you lead or think about things in a slightly different way? If you're feeling angry, that might be a solid indication that that's the case. If you're feeling depressed or frustrated, that might, again, be, be, be proof that, that I connected, right? Not here to break your heart. I'm here to suggest and talk about these things. Maybe you know why I'm wrong. Maybe you know why my thumbnail approach didn't work, that I left something critical out of the equation. Okay, or maybe you think that I just simply don't understand. But if it did take, if you did have your worldview shaken, you know it's okay to stop believing in Zechariah Sitchin, even if you wrote books about it, right? Even if you're 20 years into a career of being an alternative researcher, you know, even if you're sitting at Gobelli Tepley itself, you know, you could sit down. You can take a deep breath in and you can say, why do I believe the things that I believe? And could it be that I was critically wrong? You know, there are people who, after years, years of being a priest, being a rabbi, being a whatever, say to themselves one day, ah, shit, I'm an atheist. How the fuck did that happen? You can either be true to yourself, resonate with the new information, and be teachable and grow, or you can fight it. Whoa, it's not happening. C.W. Chandler's a total dick. <laughs> he doesn't know what he's talking about. Look, if I shook your worldview, take it on. Think about it. It's food for thought. If you know why I'm wrong, tell me about it. Could you do so in a friendly way? And fuck you, you don't know what you're talking about is not an argument. And if you think that my information is, is if it gets you angry enough to want to say F you or you don't know what you're talking about, then you're obviously saying that this stuff is important to you. If it's important to you, then it must be important enough to take the time to take that one sentence and flesh it out into five or ten. Or make a response video. Right? Not trying to hurt you. The unexplored life is not worth living. You gotta remain teachable. You gotta stay green. I gotta stay green. I gotta be able to take on new information. I gotta be able to say, holy shit, if I'm if I'm shown demonstrable proof of time travel, if I don't take that on, because of what? Because it, it shakes my worldview or whatever, then then I've done myself a disservice because we're supposed to be trying to get to truth right? We're supposed to be trying to get to how it actually works. So what are my final, my final advice and conclusions on these, on all these subjects? Well, I, I don't drink Ormus. I really don't think you should drink Ormus. Well, why don't I think you drink, should drink Ormus? Because whatever properties are, are attributed to it, whatever properties are said to exist within it, you know, I dare say that you would get the exact same effects out of a glass of water that maybe you're blessed, right? Or, you know, that it's the exact same thing that makes Ormus special, it's the exact same thing that makes the water and the, uh, the, the, the wafer and the wine special after the, after the priest does the magical incantation of transfiguration, right? And transmogrification, turning this into the body and blood of Christ. It's magic. And that's not to say that magic isn't important. I dare say that I think magic is super important. But we want to know how it actually works and we want to know what it's actually doing. Okay. Also, you know, I just want to say this is that there's this the thing that I really am protesting against in, in a lot of my videos, the thing that I'm, that I'm suggesting that, that we're doing that we're doing badly, is this notion of trying to science, uh, trying to scientize our faith. Now, no, I say I'm a new age crazy. To many degrees, I'm a gross materialist, but to a lot of degrees, I do believe in in psychic phenomena, gestalt psychology. You know, the primal scream. I believe in all sorts of weird and wacky wonderful things that have got no scientific you know basis they're just how i feel about a thing so there does seem to be this move to want to david ike everything and to want to david wilcock everything and to make it a science and the penal gland is a physical thing and it man maintains and manifests the energy the hair is an organ that processes sunlight in this way and you want to scientific you know uh, acupuncture is a scientific study that works exactly like this 
Well, I dare say that that's doing us a disservice. Number one, the scientists are waiting in the wings to kick our ass. Deepak, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Deepak Chopra sounds brilliant talking about quantum physics until anyone who knows anything about real quantum physics shows up in the room. A graduate student can make Deepak Chopra look exactly like who he is, a guy, maybe a blessed soul, maybe a beautiful guy, with absolutely no real fundamental working knowledge of how quantum physics really works. He knows terms like non-locality. He knows terms like quantum physics. He knows, you know, about the basic works of Brownian motion. And I think he probably knows a lot about the, somewhat about the works of Buckminster Fuller based on the fact that he was a disciple of transcendental meditation. I don't know why he doesn't talk about that anymore. Um, but the minute a real physicist shows up, a real guy knows anything about quantum physics, even at a graduate student level, it fucking all goes out the window, folks. I'm sorry, it does. But that might be a video for another time. Not trying to rattle any cages, not trying to get pissed anybody off, but it was what it was, it is what it is, and my shortest video is now 45 minutes. That happens, you know? Okay, guys, I love you. I had a gas making this video. I missed you guys. I missed making these videos. I hope you enjoyed seeing me again, even briefly. Maybe, maybe we'll be doing more of these. I'm very, very busy. i got a lot of stuff going on in my, my work life, uh, but I did want to take the time to share these thoughts with you and to reach out with you. Also, why do I make these videos? Because these, these bad science, these pseudo-scientific manifestations and incarnations of our sacred beliefs are doing no one a favor. All it does is make us look like idiots down the road. All it does is to encourage people to think that they know what they don't know. And it encourages, quite frankly, bad science. The notion that people are going through the, the study of this monatomic gold, or they're looking at this ornament, and they're not asking themselves fundamental questions like, yeah, but what? You know, I mean, if you could make gold at home, why would gold be valuable? You know? It just doesn't work. I love you. I love you all. Have fun. Remember what I said about remaining teachable. Okay? And if you know why I'm wrong, tell me why I'm wrong in the comments below. And I'll still love you anyway. Okay, guys. Have a wonderful day. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.